All right, I am Terry. I am Terry Ann, uh, Terry Ann Stewart Wallace, and I'm the third of uh, Pike Stewart's daughters. I have two older sisters. One's name is um, my older sister is Sherry K. Cherry K. Stewart Bell. My second oldest sister is Rhonda Stewart Wilson. I have two younger sisters, uh, Susan Donette Stewart Spence, and then my youngest sister, Penny Lou Stewart. It was my father had five girls, and they were born to, between him, my father Pike, and my mother Bessie Ann Stewart. Well, we're glad to be here with you today. We're excited to be in Pikes. Tell us a little bit about your father and the legacy that he's left here in Mooresville. Wow, that's really interesting. I can remember when I was nine years old when I first went, to, I was the first one to start working for my father. And I was nine years old and that's, you talk about back in 1968. My father was located about two blocks down the street, uh, which is now used to be a Pikes Pure Oil. But um, the McKnight Pontiac and Bu Buick decided to buy that property. So as a result, my father moved he up here, I think in 1972 was when he moved to this location. And what was really interesting about this service station, it was it was called Pikes Gulf. And it was, uh, well, no, it started off as Pikes Pure Oil. It was just a white solid building with blue trim and didn't have the roof on top, just a square building. And he wasn't here long, about four, five, six months when Gulf came in. He started selling Gulf, Gulf gas. And as a result, when Gulf taken over, they remodeled, remodeled the whole building, transitioned it, and then it became Pipes Gulf. And pretty much after Gulf went out, my dad sold Sitco gas, and then he went to selling um, Sitco gas for a while. I don't know what came in after that, but I do know that he eventually found his niche in the market. The niche in the market where he was successful all the way up until he passed two years ago was he started selling non-ethanol gas. That's gas without the ethanol in it, which was uh, which works really well for small engines, small engines, motorcycles, lawnmowers, and of course a lot of your antique cars. So he found a niche in the market and that was how he was survived by selling non-ethanol gas. And at that time, my sister Rhonda, who was an ABB here, Rhonda, she worked for my dad for almost 30, I think 30 years. But um, she, him and her was working here. And of course my dad had a tow service too. And he was the first tow service in the city of Mooresville. Uh, not just only black doing it, but he was the first to start the first towing business here. I'm not sure about the year, but he was the first. And at one time, he had a total of four records. But when he passed, he was only down to two. So he was pretty much now selling, uh, when he, before, right when he passed, he worked all the way up until, what is it? Uh, 26 days before he passed, he left his service station and got in a car with, my, with his granddaughter and went to the hospital. That was 26 days before he died. So he's a working man all his life. And my father's one of my father, well, two mottos that my father always told us. Number one, if you're going to ever have anything, you're going to have to work for it. And number two, uh, you better watch your money or somebody else will. So those are some of the famous words that he always said. He had a lot of wisdom, full of wisdom. That's the one thing that I do miss about him because there are sometimes things come up and I was like, ah, oh, what would Diddy say? What would Diddy say about this? Or Diddy say about this? But uh, my dad was born and raised here in Ardell County. He was right. He was born all. Um, uh, what they call Mayhew Town, which is out off of Brawley School Road, off of McKenzie Road, and the home place still sets there. So that's where he was born, and my father was one of six brothers, and um, there, uh, my father was the last one, the last surviving of the brothers to live. He was the last one, even though he was the third. He had three older brothers that he had three brothers that was older than him. He was the fourth brother. So. Um, uh, anything, uh, so that's where, and he always had a, a very entrepreneur spirit because uh, he never did work. And the only time he really, my mother and him, and he even talked about working was when he was about, well, he started working because, you know, it's with. He, he used to pick cotton back in the day or he'd go work people's farms it, it, there was something needed to done there was something to be done my father's education i think my father didn't get past maybe fifth or sixth grade because back in those days you know work took present 
presence over uh, going to an education, him being a male, uh, a young boy. Uh, of course, he immediately went to work. I do know he picked cotton. Uh, he did a lot of odd and end jobs from there, but he started as a young boy working down the street at the ninth Pontiac. Well, at first he went when he was 17, he went to Greensboro. Well, at 16, he went to Greensboro and worked a while. He was up in Greensboro for about two, three years. But then he came back. He came back, and then he, I guess him and my mother got together sometime between then. And they be married. And then once they were married, he started working down at the, uh, the Pontiac in, uh, McKnight's Pontiac in Buick. And what's real interesting about that story is that uh, how he got to start down there was um, always a gentleman down there that lived out in Mayhew Town. My dad went and worked odds and in jobs with him, so eventually uh, his name was Mr. Mayhew. Mr. Bus Mayhew was his name, is what he always called called him. And uh, he kind of like told my daddy, come on up. If you can do nothing, just come up and wash cars. You can do that. So that's what he started off at McKnight Pontiac and Buick is washing cars. So he started there washing cars, and he started doing different little odds and in jobs and uh, jobs for the dealership. Then eventually, and um, what led, I guess he just, if that service station was sitting there right beside the dealership for years and when it closed down he just decided well mm, maybe that's something i can do and he decided to open up the uh pike's pearl and that's where his gas station business started from there were there any influencers in your father besides mr bus was there any, like his church his family anyone that hmm. really instilled in him the entrepreneurship well, I guess I would want to, uh, it goes back through the family. One of his closest relatives was, and in my father's uh, side of the family, they love to give people names with uh, initials, but I would say Uncle T.D. Uncle T.D. and my dad was extremely close, and Uncle T.D. was the one that would come out to the payroll station and sit, sit with my dad, and, you know, sit, and he, and when the record business started, he, he, he was here and everything, but I think uh, Uncle T.D., we call him Uncle T.D., he made up Uncle T.D. Stewart. Uh, he was a, a big influence on, them, uh, on my dad, and um, I know he was, and... Um, I'll tell you some of the other, another person that was a big influence on him um, is Mr. Uh, Glenn Hooper. That was Miss Winnie Hooper's husband. She's the one that the Winnie, Miss Winnie Hooper is, Winnie Hooper Center is, is, is named after her. But he was really close to Mr. Glenn uh, Campbell. I mean, Mr. Glenn Hooper. Another influence of his was Mr. Joe Byers, who was a real good friend for him. Joseph Byers, who owned the TV service. That was a real good close friend to him. Another one I would say even would be my uncle Obi, Obi Stevenson. Obi Stevenson was the one to open the first service station here in Mooresville. And that's my uncle because he was married to my aunt Shirley Stevenson. So he was the first black business owner in Mooresville was Obi Stevenson to open the service station. And so he was one, but um, Uncle Obi, as his service station, he, when he, you know, as he grew up, he started going into more of the dump truck drive and all that. So eventually, he sold his service and he just got out of the service station business forever. But when my father first moved here to this property, this property he was renting. He was renting from the Harding family. And it was real interesting, and he always told Mr. Harding uh, that if he ever decided he was going to sell this property, he would like to be the first one that would be able to buy it. So it was real interesting, and then Mr. Harding died. I guess he passed that on to his wife, and they used to come here and buy gas. And what made my daddy's really, business really uh, good was he was a full-service service station. You had a lot of people that did not like pumping their own gas. And when he first opened here, it's not just he sold gas. He also did oil changes, sold tires, sold batteries, tire repair. He did it all. And something else he did is he created a, a concession business, which was consisted of the snowball, cotton candy, candy apple business, which he gave jobs to many to anybody that wanted to work. Anybody, whether you was young, old, mid-age, if you was down on your luck, you needed a job, my dad would give you a chance. So that's where all that, you know, all that came in work. He would be willing to work anybody that wanted to work. If you wanted to work, and a lot of people, they would fall on hard times. They would come here, hey, pipe, I need to work. Uh, I appreciate you giving me, and some of them would stay. A lot of, you know, a lot of people came through here, but he believed in it, it. You know, if my dad had, 
He wouldn't sit back. And he might he might fuss at you and tell you tell you what you ought to be doing and what you shouldn't when you shouldn't have done this the other day. But he would never say, I'm not gonna do it. If he saw that you was in need, he would give it. And I think that's one thing that he passed down to us is that you know that you always if you see somebody is trying Hold that hand out and try to pull them forward rather than, nah, nah, I want to be bothered with that and move on. That's one thing that he was really about if you saw somebody was really trying all he believed He believed in giving people second chances. I can remember one time when I was in high school, I was, well, I was in high school, I was in middle school, and I had been working for my dad. I, like I said, I started working about nine. I might have been about 13, 14 years old. I had a nice bank account. I had a little bank account. He done opened for me up at the bank and everything. And somebody asked to borrow me some money. It might borrow some money from me. And I was like, oh, they got some nerve. I don't work to make that money. They ain't getting my money. And my daddy told me, he said, let me tell you something. He said, you know, he said, it's going to come a time where you're going to need something. And, 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 you don't, and, and, and you don't know what the circumstances might be behind it. And said, how would you feel if you say that same person that you're refusing to loan money to that needs some help, uh, you you might be in a position where they're going to have to help you. And some of my mama's famous words is that don't get Get too high and mighty because that same ladder that you climbing up when you fall back down them same people you don't step on and cross over and go up they, as you fall down you gonna they gonna be climbing and you're gonna be falling down I always remember that so you will fall past them because say it can happen so never get too high where you think you never need nobody or you or you can never help somebody that's in need so that was something real that that some that was one of the things one of the lessons a lot of life lessons. A lot of life lessons from my parents. I mean, my dad was my role model. Oh Lord, he, he well, he well, he was, he is my role model. And I tell people that all the time, you know. And I'm thankful for that. A lot of people look outside their families, and some people have to go outside families for role model. But I was blessed where I had a mother and a father, strong mother and, and a very strong father, and a father who just loved us, just just loved us unconditional. And every day, you know. Even even since he gone, we still seeing his love. My dad is still doing for us things that he's laid in place is still being done for us. And we're just we're just a blessed family. And we're just so thankful for him and all that he did do for us and the things that he did leave home behind for us. Okay. okay. I, I got one quick funniest thing that happened when y'all would go on vacations and you got remember Frank. Yeah, you know, he also did camp meetings too. You did talk about that. Yeah, oh yeah, I forgot about Mars. that. We yeah. did, yeah, we yeah. did all the, did the camp meeting trails. Lord, have mercy, yeah. Jesus. But talk about the camp meeting and then some of the things that y'all, some of the um, funniest, one of the funniest. Oh, I'll tell you, one of my, one of my fondest members, there's a lot of them, yeah. but, uh, but uh, I would say he did. We used to go to what they call the camp meetings. We we would start off. Mars Chapel would usually be your first one. That where we would start. I used to hate camp meetings. You know, it's like, oh my God, there's our weekend gone. We got to go get down here camp meeting. So we usually started Mars Chapel. Then I we went we went over here across the river, across 150. There was one there, and uh, we went a few others. But one of the biggest ones locally we used to go to was Tucker's. Now I used to love to go to Tucker's, and I can remember my best friend growing up was Cynthia Davis, and. I remember me and her used to be the ones used to make my daddy's cotton candy. We was the one that made all the cotton candy for my daddy. And I remember we used to go when we get to camp meeting. On, we get, when we go down to camp meeting, we get there early so we can make sure we can make about cotton candy. And then we said, well, Daddy, uh, Mr. Pipe, said, said, Mr. Pipe, you mind if we run to the bathroom? Yeah, y'all go ahead. Boy, we leave and we run off and we go down to the piccolo. They used to have a piccolo and tuck us candy. <laughs> They had a piccolo. A lot of people don't know what a piccolo is, which they call it jukebox, whatever. They had all the latest thing. Had little little ears stretched out. Little, little had a little, little had a little small little little uh, little house where the where the piccolo sit, where you know, and sit there and play the music. Got and we dance, we dance, we dance. And then all of a sudden, we see my daddy coming. We have run back down the opposite way and beat around there and get back before he get back. And he have his mouth all stuck out. But anyway, he'd be mad. But uh, they can be. And then he got so good, he start going. South Carolina. 
I didn't go with I went a few times down to the South Carolina, but they was down there on the weekends and stuff. But I didn't by that time I was married and I think uh married and I had a job. I was working full time with the uh Charlotte uh Mecklenburg Police Department, so I didn't get to travel and work and like I used to, but Rhonda and my mom and I remember Patricia Davis, that's Sid Davis uh sister and our cousin our late cousin Shirley Stewart and then we always had Harold Beatty, Gilbert Pfeiffer uh anybody that, uh then I look at Alley Cat, uh Richard Torrance and Presley Torrance, uh Frankie Torrance, all them, they was very loyal to my daddy and worked here a lot. But they a lot of them did the Cam Meeting Trail Trail. There's a lot of other people, but uh I just I'm sorry if I don't remember their names right now, but it was a lot of people that worked. But um and one thing my dad always did, I can rem I can remember like, you know, like I don't know, like when we grew up, you know, uh, I never thought about racism and segregation, even though all this stuff was going on all around us, it was never a problem because I looked at my dad, my dad worked, he was a, he was a businessman and he would always say 95 of my, 95% of my business is white. And, uh, the one thing my daddy always, one of the greatest lessons my daddy always taught me was yes, ma'am no ma'am yes sir no sir please thank you he said that will carry you a long way and my daddy taught me very early to speak up uh, speak up speak up speak to people there's never no it's never you there's never any harm and said hello how you doing to anybody he said i don't care who these always speak to people so he had a regiment he used to teach me he said let me tell you something baby when you got that in them people's car you say hello ma'am hello sir uh how are you doing today and how can i help you that was pretty much the way he taught me to do that so i always do that and they tell me what they want pump the gas and of course once they pump the gas you always say thank you thank you ma'am thank you sir and please come back and see us and uh that's real funny now because right now i work for the um I, well, I'm retired. I'm retired from uh, from a law enforcement career, and um, and I work part time for the Mecklenburg County ABC store. I'm just a cashier. But uh, <laughs> I had a manager ask me to. Why do you always tell people to come back? You know they're coming back. I said it's just a habit that I learned from a child. My father always said, "Tell people to come back." Say like, thank you, play, thank thank you. Come back and see us, and that was something that stuck with me. And so that's kind of like a uh, like a memory thing for me. Whenever I tell the customers ABC, thank you, please come back. And um, something else as a chat, like oh, back to the racism part. Uh, like I said, so my father always taught us to treat people the way we want to be treated regardless of what the color of your skin was no matter where you come from or what you stood for or whatever you always you know to give to get respect you had to give respect so that was one thing he always taught us my mom always taught us it's um, one and another thing he did they didn't play that my mom and my father never uh um Never did uh, stand for anybody being disrespectful. And one thing that we, I don't care, my mother said, let me tell you something. It's, it, it, and even with adults, when, oh, she said, I don't care if that's a dull, if any adult is disrespecting you being mean, that's my place. You come to me. You don't say, because I, so I'm going to tell you right now, you can go out here and talk back you want to. I'm going to tell your tail up at home because that's not your place. I'm not raising you to be disrespectful. You shut your mouth. You listen. You come back. You let me in your daddy know and then it's our place to handle because what's between adults is between adults so that was something that was taught early respect and they always said to have respect you get respect you have to give respect so like i said that and, and it didn't matter whether you was black white pink purple brown yellow green whatever oh i don't care if you was the town drunk you know, you were, oh, you were still respectful. That's just the way we were trained. You know, no matter what you are or what you did or what you've been through, if you was an adult, an adult is an adult, an adult, you will respect them. So um, that's something I passed on to my daughter too, that I always told her, you know, uh, you don't disrespect. Like going to school, like now we have so many problems with our children, our black children being so disrespectful. Respectful. And I see it every day. I, I, I worked a while in the school system as a police officer and as well as when I wasn't a police officer, I worked for the school system. And I, and I just look at and I just think a lot of times, a lot of our children have never been taught 
how to respect those, not to have manners. Yes, to me, you know, like a lot of people, a lot of black mentality. This ain't no slave days. I ain't saying no yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. But you know, it's still kindness is something that comes out of the Bible, and that goes all the way back. I'm getting also, but anyway, it goes all the way back to you look into uh, what's that? Uh, Galatians, the sixth chapter, where it talks about the fruits of the spirit. Uh, all that talks about love, peace, kindness, gentleness, peace. Patience, goodness, self-confidence, and of course, you know, and you put all that there and, and, and put on top of that, love. And of course, there's nothing that, you know, that, that, there's no law concerning any of those. And then I, I just, you know, and my parents taught me that, and you know, they taught me, they taught us that as a young. We didn't understand it, a lot of stuff I understand a whole lot better now than I did back then. But when it comes to the racism stuff, and we went to school where, you know, and I saw a lot of things that I didn't like and that sort of thing. And, but, you know, um, I, and, I, and, I, and I see a lot of racism today and stuff, but we wasn't raised that way. And like I said, as a kid, we was always just surrounded by love and encouragement and everything. So I just never felt that my life was ever, I was ever missing anything or shorted on anything in life. I, so far, like I tell people, I've had a great life. A great life, because I was thankful to have my dad for 61 years. And, 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 uh, and now I think I knew it was coming. But to now say I don't have him, it, it, it's hard. It really is hard. And you know, and then, but what makes me feel good is like right now, me sitting here being interviewed about my dad. I wouldn't be sitting here if it hadn't been that my dad done laid a legacy or, a, you know, a legacy down for me to fall and walk through. And I can sit here and I can talk about him. And um, so, one of, oh, you told me, and one other thing my father did, I think I was about maybe about eight years old he took us on our first vacation family vacation i think i was about eight years old my daddy had a <laughs> had a pontiac a pontiac bondeville and like i mean we all got up in there i think uh donette was sitting in the front seat between uh uh, no, 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 no. Penny was in the front seat between my mom and my daddy. And no, no, no. Donnett was in the front seat. My mama was holding Penny, and B, K, and Ronnie was in the back seat. But that Von de Bill was loaded down. My mom had cooked a big ham and fried chicken dinner so we could stop on the road. <laughs> and our first family trip was to uh, Virginia Beach. That was the start of my first family trips. And what was and, and one of the first lines that I saw of racism when I was about eight years old that we would pull up the hotels up there at the beach beach front hotels and we would see or see vacancy signs but when they pull up and they saw it was black people in the car they would throw the signs out we go oh no no we don't know oh i don't know why that signs over but anyway we messed around and we went down that beach to every hotel on that beach we went across the bridge over the bridge and went over and came to this place called rudy's rudy's and uh they had vacancies and then we ended up they gave us this great big old vacation house with some like vacation rooms so we went back and did that all the way to that place when i'd have been just, we went every year on family vacation there and as we got older you know we started oh we tied so then we graduated went to las vegas and uh vegas went down the tunica mississippi uh biloxi and we did a lot with my father my father went to atlanta georgia washington dc new york uh went across i remember we was out in vegas drove across uh, to California. My dad was in the car. We went to Beverly Hills, California. Got out in Beverly Hills and we was at a store in Beverly Hills and they had clothes all out. They had some shoe rack outside of a men's store and they had all these shoes on sale. And the uh, man come out and said, sir, what you trying to pay? My daddy said, how much are those going for? He said, $9.99. My daddy said, oh, them some nice shoes for $9.99. He said, they're $999. And so my daddy said, what? Oh, no, what? What? Those shoes do they cost that much? But uh, we did a lot. I just have so many memories. But one of my fondest memories of my dad when we was on vacation. You know, you always look up to your dad as your protector and all that. And, you know, and he was our protector. But one particular time we went to a haunted house at Virginia Beach. And so we convinced my daddy, oh, daddy, let's go on in here. Let's go on in here. So we, he paid everybody's went in, and my dad was, he always, anywhere we go where, he always made us go front. He was always at the back. It was, and so we got there and we didn't, everybody was fussing about the haunted house wasn't no good and oh, it wasn't scary. So we got back and there was this uh, coffin sitting there with this thing in it and we was laughing and pointing it. And my daddy was standing back. All of a sudden that thing raised up out of that coffin <laughs> and we all flew out. But my daddy was at the front then. He's the first one out. <laughs> 
was the first one out, but that's one of the funniest memories we had. And we ran, and I mean, when we ran out, we ran up the street about two blocks. And then we all just had to just stop and just laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh. So that was just some of the things. It was always a good time with my father. Always. He, he was just always so full of wisdom. And uh, it was just always a great time. And that's what I really miss about him. Can you tell us about the CB? Uh, the CB, he met a lot of people. He went to the CB. CB convention down in uh, um, New Orleans, but anyway, my daddy loves CB. My daddy has the tendency if he likes something, he goes B. So then with the CB stuff, he went all to the jamborees and all that stuff. And then my dad decided he gonna start having a CB. He, he used to do it here at the service station. And I think his thing was wagon wheel. Had this little train whistle he'd blow. And a lot of people used to uh, make fun of my daddy because he stuttered. But one thing we used to sit back and listen to my daddy on that CB radio, he never stuttered, never. And he just talk and go on and just go on for hours. But anyway, my daddy set up a, a CB uh, antenna at the house that was probably about 60 feet tall. Anyway, he got in trouble with the, with the FCC because he had too much power in his CB. So, but anyway, but he loved his CB radio. And so that was something that, that he really loved was that CB. That was one of his hobbies that he had. And uh, some of his other hobbies, he didn't fish or anything, but his main thing when it comes to hobbies, he was just basically about his business and the welfare of people and seeing people do and be better. I would say that was that would be the, one of the most important things in him was he wanted to see people be uh, do good, do well, and be better. And um, that was one thing that I would say about him. Any other questions? I'm just talking. I know, you, you do it, but I, I can remember <clears throat> when I would come up and y'all be like, on vacation, and, and when everybody get back, it, it, everybody be happy going. When they get back, oh, they're right, they're mad. Mad. <laughs> oh yeah, we have our disagreements, and that's just us as a family. Um, as a family, now I'm gonna tell you something. I, I mean, it, ooh, it can get brutal. In my family, it can get brutal. I mean, you know, we'll go at it, and then we'll go at it with each other, and then we they, and, and we might apologize, we might not, but we're not gonna stay mad at each other. You know, we because we do love one another. That's one thing that love is in the center, and uh, in that you know, as, as a Adults now we do apologize. Like years ago, we'd be mad when say nothing. Then we'd come back and be friends. And we might a couple years ago. You remember that time you did that to me? You did, yeah. But uh, but yeah, we would all come back. We'd be able to get on each other's nerves, and all of a sudden we, we you know. So, but uh, I guess that's just family. So you know, even now, uh, me and my sisters, you know, we still argue, and then we laugh, and then the, and then it's the grandchildren that, that sometimes say, "Oh, I can't believe y'all act like that." And we say, "Oh, this ain't nothing new. We've been doing this. This has always been this way." And then my dad used to love to come back, and I'm and my father used to would not fly. That was another thing about him. We that's why we everywhere we went we used to drive and he used to drive. So after my, my father suffered with glaucoma and even that that he, he never lost his sight, but he lost a lot of it. And uh, so he got to a place where he couldn't drive. So that's when I stepped up to the plate and began to drive. Boy, I tell you, ooh, he's get behind me and cuss me out. <laughs> when I, cause I, I used to drive, I drive just like he do. I drive just like he do. Cause I came one time, we we could be going down the road to Tunica, Mississippi. We might be going 95, then we might be doing 35. I mean, you know, but anyway, I don't drive like that. But uh, but he used to drive fast. And that's one thing he used to hate about me. Cause I, I don't think I'm a fast driver, but I'm a type of person. I'm like him when I get in a car and I got somewhere to go. I don't want to be erupted. I don't want nobody stop and ask to use the bathroom. I don't want to hear about your hunger. I don't want to stop because I don't want to hear. I got, I, I'm going over here. We're going to get there as fast as we can. That's where my dad was, so I take that from him. I got another question. Okay. All right. All right. He could count money. Now, I want you to tell us about him counting. Now, you couldn't get it now with money. Now, he could to count some money. And he could sit right there in that chair and see exactly how much gas was going up on there. No, I'm not it was getting cold and I feel like he'd come in, you know, my, uh, yeah. Now, one thing about my dad, yeah, he could count his money. I'll tell you one thing, and, and if he, 
He used to, and he used to send you that bag. You could play around. You want to. You better put every dime in there. He said he knew exactly what he sent. He tell you bring his receipts back. They better be right. Cause I mean he'd have different people that would work for him. He'd send somebody like they take five or ten dollars out. They think he wouldn't know. When he got back, and went my receipt. Or a lot of times he'd be done called the bank and told the bank ahead of time what he was sending up there. So he made sure his workers got there. But yeah, he could count. And I love you. Like like, uh, and then he'd go to camp. And I don't know what that was about. And I used to sit there like, ooh, why you do that? That money's dirty, you know. But yeah, you couldn't get him on that money. That was what I was, and his famous saying, you better watch your money or somebody else will watch it or watch it for you. So he was real big about, he was big on savings. He used to tell us about uh, if if you can't pay cash, he, he felt, he, this is another motto, cash is king. He didn't believe in credit cards and financing and all that kind of stuff. Cause I can remember my dad, um, I remember my dad bought uh my mother bought my he's used to buying cars and paying them off in three years. And I remember when he bought my mother's last car, um, they wanted to finance for five years. Oh, he he about lost it. But I think he ended up financing four years. He thought it was the end of the world. He said then, I never finance another car. Never. Never. He said that's one of the biggest rackets out here is financing vehicles. So, you know, so he was real big about, you know, not a lot of credit card debt and uh, you know, just be mindful and, and savings. He was real big on savings. Yeah, it was. But he can sit right in that chair. He saw everything. And, and, and see them dead from good. Yeah. And another thing about my dad is it, it, we laugh about. Uh, we it, we got a lot of family pictures and stuff. And this is my daddy in the family pictures. And they, and people would comment, why is Pike always, he was never asleep. He would sit there with his eyes closed. And he heard everything that went around in that room. And then it's something real interesting come, he just see just gonna look. But if we got out of line, he didn't mind shutting us down. He'd come up out of that sleep and shut us down right quick. And uh I tell you something else that um that's kind of funny too is like I said, we always say my daddy was nosy too. <laughs> he knew everything. He knew everything. And then my dad, of course, uh it, it, it's a lot of stories I can sit here all day and talk about if you grew up in my dad grew up in the house with five girls and I can remember um they, we 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 in a three bedroom, one bath house was what we had. We only had one bathroom and a three bedroom. My poor daddy never got to the bathroom, so <laughs> that's when they decided to add him to the house. My mom said we got to get Pipe a bathroom because you girls don't ever let Pipe get to the bathroom. So that's that's a funny story too. But I think it was interesting to bond. And then another thing, I growing up with five girls, and I mean you know he it, it was almost like he was just uh. He was like another big kid like us. Cause you know, whatever he did, whatever we do, I'm going with y'all. A lot of times my mom said, oh no, I ain't going with you. I'm going with them. And uh, one of one of uh, real, we was laughing the other day about one of our last memories with him and my daddy, we was doing hospice at home. Uh, my daddy raised up out the beat. I said, uh, daddy, where you going? We was all there. And he said, I'm going with y'all. Uh, he, I said, where are we going? I don't know where y'all going, but I'm going. And we going to leave as soon as that buck get out of the bathroom. And now it's a going story, too, because Rodney was always going to the bathroom. And that was, he used to fuss about that and about her going, and why we couldn't get where we was going, because we had to stop all the time for Rodney to go to the bathroom. But with some of our best times that as a family were with on our family vacations. Yeah. Any other questions? And then one time, the bus station used to stop here. Did he bus yes, he did, Dad. Did the Greyhound bus station here that didn't last too long he did triple a when he did his wrecker he was a triple a i remember he used to go up to the mountain to get apples and nuts and stuff and bring that back he used to sell coal here my dad if, if he felt like it was any way he could make money he tried it he tried it so that's just some of the things he's done over the years i mean sell apples oranges like i said coal he go get coal another thing that my dad did in his business is that you know he tried it you know if he had people if if he had people that uh you know have fallen on hard times he would always try to loan and help out and do and do my daddy was alone well, i'm not alone but my daddy was a bail bomb to get people got a lot of people out of jail <laughs> Yeah, I say he's the bail bomb. He got a lot of people out of jail and things like that. So he did a, and, and, I, and some of the last things he told us. So he said, you know, I've lived a good life. That was some of his last and final words. He said, he said he lived life. He lived a good full life, and he did 
He said he did everything that he wanted to do, so he never had any regrets in life. And he's been, he's seen, he saw a lot. So, you know, and before he left, he, he told us and he said that, you know, he was accepting of what was coming for. And, you know, and, and uh, I myself, one of the greatest things, uh, greatest thing uh, with my father, one of my greatest memories is listening to him express his love for Jesus Christ. So that was, that was major. And uh, so that's why now, sometimes I might cry or whatever, but I know where he's at. And I was with my father when he took his last breath, and I thank God for that. That was one of the most amazing things I ever seen in my life. I was so thankful that I was there. Me and, and his oldest granddaughter, Carmika Wilson, we was both there when he left this world. So, And that's something I prayed and asked the Lord to be, Lord, don't let him leave without me. I want to be there when he leave. And I was there. So, and that's, that, that's meant the world to me that I saw him leave. And uh, so I have no doubt about where my father's at. No doubt whatsoever. Any other questions? And he grew up in the, which church area? Oh, and my dad was a faithful, a lifetime member to Mars Chapel United Methodist Church. That was his home church as a boy. That's where the family went to Mars Chapel. Uh, that was the only church my father ever went to. My mother, um, I uh, used to attend Jerusalem Baptist Church, but eventually she moved her membership to Mars Chapel too. So Mars Chapel is his, was a lifetime church, and my father is buried there in the cemetery at Mars Chapel. But those was his wishes. He wanted to go back home, and he has several family members. There's a lot of them out there. So Mars Chapel, and, and, and think about my father, he always supported Mars. He calls, he's called it Mars, Mars Chapel, but we know it's Mars Chapel, United Methodist Church. And my father didn't go often, and then my dad and make me sick when I go to church. Oh, Pike, what brought you to church today? That's why I don't go. They make me sick. Always ask me, Pike, where you be? Oh, Pike, what's going on? You in church today. So that's why. <laughs> but he didn't go every Sunday. But he always supported. They ever needed anything or uh, he could ever contribute. He'd always help any way that he could because he did love his church and his church family. And a lot of the ministers that came through there, he loved them. Like uh, one minister that recently died, uh, Reverend Paul Levere. That was one that he was real close to um, the oh the African minister that was from Greensburg yeah, yeah Mr. Do he was crazy about Mr. Do and um it was a it was a um, Cornelius Collins it was several of them Rhonda would know that better but there were some of them he just loved but uh but yeah it was a lot of the ministers that he was really close to and he really liked them and thought the world of them any other questions. I think you got somebody outside. Oh, I, 